folks, we'd just like to give you all a very warm welcome. I think that burst of energy earlier on has certainly uh, wakened you all up and uh, will keep you alert. Uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but you nearly gave me a heart attack. And whatever was wrong with my back is just fixed because I jerked that much. So that'll save me a few pounds going to the physio, and I'll pass it on to a uh, good friend, John McKeg as well. But uh, we're delighted to see you all, and we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. Thank you for joining with us. I know you've had a busy day. Uh, some not only here this morning, but uh, quite a number gathered out for the open air. I know they've been going on from May, every Lord's Day afternoon, going around the town of Cumber, preaching the gospel, doing outreach around the doors as well. And uh, you'd expect coming into the month of July when the schools are off, it's holiday season, people are away, that numbers would slightly go down while they're increasing at the open air, uh, that a token of the Lord's blessing. And uh, we had a goodly number gathered and the word was preached and testimonies given and Bible shots and we do believe in the outreach that God is working. So continue to pray and we trust as we would keep the open air work up uh, God willing, right through to the end of August, uh, that in the absence of friends who are on holiday, that you will make an effort. Maybe you haven't got out yet to the open air. Maybe you would like to come out. Well, you're very welcome to stand with us. Don't fear, you'll not be asked to open in prayer. You'll not be asked to give your testimony. You'll not be asked to preach or anything like that. Uh, just stand there, support us. Uh, I was coming down the road. It was just delayed slightly, coming down the carriageway. And so a few minutes just before the open air started, I turned around the corner. You could hear the voice. I saw people gathered at the end of the street, young people, and you could see them looking up. And then I knew exactly where the open air was. Those same young people actually followed my car down uh, and they walked past to see what was going on. And so did many others. Uh, it was very clear. You could hear that. Uh, just to see the witness, just those folks gathered. I tell you something, it really lifted my soul. Now that in these days, whenever there's a declension and a real fear to go out into the community and reach souls for Christ, it's good to see those that are standing in the open air. And we're not alone. We're not alone. Many in this province. It's just remarkable where the Lord has his people. And wherever you go, there's outreach being done. It's lovely to be handed a gospel tract, you know. It's lovely. And you miss that nowadays. People say, I should have thrown them down. It's a waste of time. It's not. It's not. I love to go to city centres and town centres and see people giving out gospel literature or standing, doing an open air and preaching Christ, reaching out to their fellow man. And what a blessing that is. I was able to purchase uh, these huge coins. They're about that size. I always keep maybe four or five of them in my little wallet. And when I'm out and about, I look for little places. Uh, we're out walking and maybe there's just a little hollow in a tree. Uh, it's a big, beautiful aluminium coin, and it has scripture on both sides of it. And you just set it in the hollow of that tree, and it's just remarkable if someone finds that. And then they read it and keep it. It has the word of God on both sides, two good gospel texts. And it's able to purchase them, get them uh, over to the province here, another man and myself. And uh, we don't hand them out, but we just place them. Just as you're walking, suddenly a little nook. And there it is. You just know. And if you ever find one and you're a believer, bring it back to me. Young person, there'll be a reward in it for you. Older person, your reward's in heaven. All right. But bring it back to me. And then, or if you don't want to, just take it and maybe either leave it there or place it. And you say, that boy doesn't know where to place these things. I'll show him where to place it. Well, we don't want to give them out because uh, they're very expensive. But when you, when you place them strategically, I believe then the Lord will just draw the right person to find it. And when they do, they're like magpies. <laughs> they just take it, it shines, it has the gospel both sides. And even if they reject it, they'll, they'll certainly read it. Once they find that, what's that? And that's, I think that's the way we need to be going out. I like the way some people taught me to do outreach. I thought it was a, a real good idea. And one fellow says to me, do you know sometimes you go up, you say, gospel track." You know, God's way of salvation. People just, no thanks. And one fellow said to me, you should try this. And we, we did, we did, and we were very successful. Uh, we just go basically and you just say, excuse me, yes. You didn't get one of them, did you? And as if everybody in the world's got one, but I didn't. What? What is it? He said, you didn't get one then? No. Well, here you are. Before you know it, they have taken the track. <laughs> they've read it. And they've got the gospel. Uh, 
Sorry, men, I don't know what happened there. It was me that time. So it's very sensitive, a bit like my back at the minute. Okay, so folks, we, we're thankful to that. I intend, in the will of God, next Lord's Day morning, I know we have a little dedication as well, but I intend to preach on the subject of soul winning. Uh, you very rarely hear that subject preached on. It used to be in our churches and in our fellowship and our denomination, what is known as the Soul Winners Convention, where you challenged people to missionary work, we know that our Easter convention generally does that, but that appeal should be coming out from the local church. I want to preach on soul winning. I want to preach on that subject and apply it. We need to be reaching out beyond the four walls of this church, and we are, but we need to keep doing that. We've got a gospel mission coming up in October, and we want just to gear some of our messages toward that venture in faith, to reach out and to see precious souls brought to know the Saviour. So we're going to continue in our services, welcoming you all in our Saviour's name. And those that are listening on the World Wide Web, we welcome our online community as well. 213 in our hymn book for those that use it at home and even in the church, and the words should come up on the screen. Was it for me, for me alone, the Saviour left his glorious throne? It was for me, yes, all for me. Let's stand together after the key as we worship. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing.
Amen. Amen. That's good singing. We'll just take a few moments and we'll unite our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious and our eternal loving Heavenly Father, it is with joy and thanksgiving that we enter into thy most holy presence. We thank thee for those of us who are born again, those of us who are washed in the blood and saved by sovereign grace, that we can truthfully say, by experience it was for me. Yes, all for me. O oh, love of God, so great, so free. A wondrous love I'll shout and sing. He died for me, my Lord and King. And we thank thee, O oh God, that it was for me. He bowed his head upon the cross and freely shed his precious blood, that crimson tide. Was it for me? The Saviour died. It was for me. And Lord, we thank thee for how personal the gospel is. We bless thee, O God, that some gathered in this house perhaps cannot truthfully say by experience that I know Christ died for me. They haven't come to him. They haven't believed on him. They have not repented and received him. And we pray for such tonight, both in this house and those who will be listening on via the internet ministry. We pray for such that each one might come under conviction tonight and by thy spirit they may be converted to Christ. We pray, Lord, you will draw nigh and visit with us in this gospel hour where thy presence would intensify upon all of our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that we will be brought to consider where we will spend eternity and that we might be sure about these matters. There'll be no doubt whatsoever. And if there's any anxiety or concern or even doubt that we might put it right tonight, get it fixed, get it sorted tonight. And for those our God and Father out of Christ without a Savior, no hope to cheer the tomb. May this be the night that they're turned to the cross, that they by faith come to Christ and Lord seek him for salvation. Right across our land we join with many others that meet in like fashion. And those who stand, Lord, to preach the whole counsel of God, to uplift the blood-stained banner of the cross, to preach a living Savior to dead sinners, to preach, O God, a loving God to sinners who are rebellious, and to preach the everlasting gospel of thy saving grace in Christ. We pray to this end, the Spirit of God will breathe upon every uh, blood-bought, born-again preacher of the gospel, and grant, O God, the ambassadors of the cross tonight, uh, those who are fishers of men, uh, Lord, will cast the net far and wide. And as we draw it in at the end of our meetings, we do so humbly with prayer, expecting thee, O God, to bring the fish with us and to bring our sheaths with us. We ask, Lord, you'll give us fruit for our labor. And whatever work we have to do tonight, we might do it with all of our might. And if we're plowing, and that's all we're doing tonight, Lord, if we're not going to sow as such, if we're not going to water as such, we're not going to cultivate the harvest as such. We're not going to see an increase or even reap. We pray, O oh God, if the only task tonight is to plow and make the ground ready for some other time or person, then we want to plow well. We want to do that work extremely well. And then if we are to sow tonight, and if that's all we're going to do is sow in this meeting, then we would want to sow well. And if we are, O oh God, to water uh, further, the gospel seed that has already been ploughed and sown upon, then we pray we might water it well. Then we pray, O oh God, if we are to see the increase and we are to reap the harvest of good, that we will reap well. And thou will give us, O oh God, uh, that blessing. And whatever task we are commissioned to do tonight, and even if it means ploughing, sowing, watering and reaping, whatever it is, we pray we might do it well for thee. Give us help from the sanctuary. Bless each head bowed and each home represented. And thou knowest the need of every single individual, from the youngest child discerning between the right and left hand good and evil, to the oldest individual. We pray you'll search out this congregation. And Lord, thou knowest those that are thine and those that are not. We pray that you'll save them tonight. May this be the night in their experience when they're born again and saved by sovereign grace. So, Father, we commit meetings like this to thee, and while on others thou art calling, do not pass us by in this meeting house. Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost, restore the backslider, revive the church, 
Glorify thy Son. And the people of God said, Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to perhaps an unfamiliar uh, passage of Scripture. That's the book of Obadiah. The book of Obadiah. And we're going to read this book together. The book of Obadiah. I'm sure many of you have looked it up already, so you're not flicking. Don't hear too many pages being moved about. So uh, if you're at the book of Amos or you're in the book of Jonah, well, it's in between those two, about the fourth book of the biblical order. Uh, Not the historical, but the biblical order. And you come to the book of Obadiah. Book of Obadiah then, chapter 1, and the verse 1, this will finish the little series that we've been doing in the uh, surveying and uh, just summarizing the books of the minor prophets. The book of Obadiah, chapter 1, and that's all there is, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. And as I said to you, Edom is synonymous with Esau. Concerning Edom, we have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. This is Esau, or Edom. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Obviously the Lord saying, I leave none. How? are the things of Esau. Now, he's using the term synonymously, Edom, Esau, because the Edomites are the descendants of Jacob's brother Esau. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter for thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Now, that's important. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Now when did that happen? We know that Jacob made friends with Esau. We know that Esau says after I bury my parent. And I'm going to make sure I do you to death. Jacob you'll never survive what I'm going to do to you. And we know that Jacob wrestled with God all night. And he sent out his family and divided them into two parts. That if Esau went after one he'd be able to save the other half. But God showed him mercy, and Esau came with 400 men. And Jacob sent gifts to appease him, but he didn't need to. God already dealt with his heart. So when did this violence come against Jacob? I'll tell you when it came. Do you remember the Minor Prophets? It's all about the Babylonish captivity. Whenever Babylon destroyed the remnants of the Assyrian army and the confederacy with Egypt, I want to tell you, when the Babylonians destroyed the Assyrians, the Babylonians took Jerusalem. And it was then, then God marked Esau out for destruction. Because rather than aid and assist his brother Jacob, the descendants of Esau, Edom, joined with the Babylonians. And they slaughtered men, women, and children. And the Bible tells us, God saw that and he marked that. Even though he was chastened in his children, the instrument was Babylon, not Edom. And the Edomites, they waited until some of the stragglers got away. They killed them. Some sought refuge and ran away. And they slaughtered them. They went into the very city of Jerusalem and they butchered men, women, and children. 
Edomites were wicked individuals, descendants of Esau. And the Lord says, this judgment is coming because of your violence against your brother Jacob. It was hundreds of years later before this actually was brought to fulfillment. In fact, it was during the Maccabean age prior to basically coming into the New Testament era. We know that the Maccabean age was that time whenever the Edomites were completely destroyed. It is remarkable that the Edomites joined the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem. And another group of people, the Nabatines, you call them, they destroyed Edom, the great city of Petra, built into the rocks. If you could see it today, you'll see it, Petra, the great city, the capital of Edom, built into the rock, the red rock. There's the capital. You can actually stand there today on that historical site and there's not a human being as inhabited from the Maccabean age. What happened was it was destroyed by the Nabatines. If I get that right, the pronunciation that is. Just shortly after Edom left to go and destroy Jacob, his brother, God already started the judgment. And the Edomites had to scatter and they, they scattered close to, to Judah. And as a result of that, the Edomites, they, they lived and they were called the Idumeans. You read it in scripture, Idumea. You've seen that word in the Bible. You've seen those people, Idumeans. It's, it's really a regeneration, resurgence of the Edomites who were destroyed when they left their city and abandoned it because they thought nobody could attack them. But the Nabatines came and destroyed that city and killed them. And all the men of war fled and they settled and they were called the Idumeans. In fact, in AD 70, Titus, the Roman governor, he commissioned about 20,000 of them and they went in and they destroyed the Jews again. And God marked them out for complete destruction. A few years after that, they were wiped off the face of the earth. You could not trace to this day a single descendant of Esau. Such was the total destruction of this city. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame, verse 10, shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now look what it says. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, do you remember the Babylonians? And foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was one of them. You were among them. And I saw it. You were on the other side. Look at verse 12. But thou shouldest not looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should thou, shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway. In other words, when they were running from the Babylonians, they met the Edomites, and they lay in wait in ambush, and they killed them. Their descendants of Jacob, their, their brother, they destroyed them. To cut off those, verse 14, of his that did escape, Neither should, shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of his distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. And what will I do to Edom will be a mirror image of the last judgment on the last day. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return on to, upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Isn't that remarkable? No future for Esau, but a future for Jacob and Israel. And the house of Jacob, verse 18, shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them, and devour them. And by the way, it was the Jews 
who eventually wiped out the Edomites. And they, verse 18, and there shall be not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Zepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And Saviour shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau. Now this is it. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Amen. We know the Lord will bless the reading of the book of Obadiah. Now you can meet Obadiah in heaven and say, yes, I've read your little book. I'm going to ask our, one of our elders, Mr. Colin McKee, if he'll come just now. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, it is good to see you all in the house of God tonight. Welcome you in the Saviour's name. And even if there's any visiting, we bid you a special welcome. And again, those online, trust again that you will know the Lord's blessing and even feel amongst us even here tonight. The services for the incoming week, remember especially our Bible week this week for the boys and girls from Monday through to Thursday each night at 6.30 through to 7. Remember to come along and bring the boys and girls into these meetings. And especially pray for the meetings, that the Lord would really bless the work, and that even some of these boys and girls might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior. Remember, even Robert and all of the workers, pray for them especially too, that the Lord will give them help. Remember our prayer meeting and Bible study on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Plan to come along even to that meeting. On Friday night at 10 p.m., our men's prayer meeting. Next Lord's Day, the services will be at the usual times of 11.30 and 7, both preceded by a time of prayer. And the will of the Lord, the Reverend Martin, will be here for those services. We'll having a special retiring offering next Lord's Day, and that will be for the work of Let the Bible Speak. As I said this morning, we're having a special dedication service for uh, James and Joanna Wiley's little baby Joshua next Lord's Day morning. And again, remember our open air meeting Next Sunday, God willing, in the afternoon in the square at Cumber at 3 p.m. and even plan to attend that meeting. A couple of special announcements. Remember that of the 12th week, the prayer meeting will not take place on a Tuesday night as normal, but will be moved to the Wednesday night, the 14th of that week. And also the special family and friends service on the Sunday evening, the 25th of July, where Ford Arnold will be sharing his testimony. And as I said this morning, pray for Ford, that the Lord will help him even through this. We know it will be very difficult for him. Pray that the Lord will bless him and the Lord will help him. And even pray for your friends and your family and seek to invite even the unsaved in, even to this special service. Thank you. Well, we would like to thank our brother for making those announcements, and as always, they're subject to the divine will of the Lord. Let's sing again before we come to the preaching of the word. This time it's the hymn 103 in our hymn book. Have you read the story of the cross where Jesus bled and died when your debt was paid by the precious blood that flowed from his wounded side? We'll stand together as we sing all of the hymn, please. Let's all stand as we sing.
Let's just bow briefly in prayer as we take our Bibles and open again at the book of Obadiah. Father, we thank thee for a sense of thy presence through today. We thank thee for the close of another Lord's Day and no better place, Lord, to close this day in worship than in the house of God. We thank thee for help given in the worship and in the ministry of thy word. And for the many, O God, this morning and tonight and through the internet who have heard the word. And even in the open air, we thank thee, O God, for the word of the Lord that has gone forth. And even on the printed page, given into the hand and through the door, we pray you'll bless the word and cause individuals around this church and further afield to read the word, to come under conviction. We pray that you'll save the lost and answer prayer. And loving Father, as we come now to the hearing and preaching of the gospel, Lord, we realize it's a very solemn time. And we're charged, O God, with this responsibility in the Lord's Day evening to preach Christ and him crucified. And who is sufficient for these things? Our sufficiency is of God, who maketh us able ministers of the new covenant, new testament. And to this end, almighty God, I pray for preparation of my own heart and the hearts of those who hear. Take away every wandering thought and distraction, and even, Lord, tiredness and weariness of mind. We pray, Lord, you will just solemnize the atmosphere. Lift this meeting out of the natural realm. Bring it into the supernatural. Lift it out of an ordinary meeting, into an extraordinary by the power of God. Lift it out of the usual, into the unusual by the power of thy Holy Spirit. To this end, Almighty God, in the Saviour's great name, for thine eternal glory, I ask for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I pray, Lord, that thou wouldst give me that endowment of power from on high. I pray for that mighty baptism of fire and power for preaching. I ask, Lord, for that anointing that enables me, O God, to make much of Christ. I ask to this end for the filling of the Spirit with wisdom and power for the preaching of the everlasting gospel. And Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost, restore the backslidden, revive the church, glorify thy Son, and the people of God said, Amen. And I'm sure you're aware that there has been a recurring theme in most of the books of the Minor Prophet, uh, which has been the temporal and the uh, local and the future judgment that's coming upon the nations. The local, that is, it was localized by the prophet, uh, singling out individuals or cities for that matter. And then, of course, it was uh, temporal because it only lasted for a certain time. And then it was future. And so that judgment right throughout the minor prophets was always going to be a mirror image of the last and great and terrible day of the Lord, as the prophet Joel tells us, as John in the book of the Revelation and the chapter 6 reminds us, uh, the great day of his wrath has come. That's the great day. There's no day like that. All these other judgments we're looking at in the minor prophets all point to that one great event, uh, the rolling of the years and the gathering of the nations under the feet of Christ when he comes to judge the living and the dead. These books clearly teach us that we have a God of judgment. In ecumenical churches and circles today, they center on the love of God, continually on the love of God. We don't deny that God is love. We wouldn't be here if God wasn't love. There'd be no such a place called Calvary if God wasn't love. There wouldn't be a single soul saved if God wasn't love. We don't deny his love. But we also turn the coin over. He's a God of justice, a God of righteousness. How can we overlook the attributes of our God? What kind of God is he if he's just a God of love and nothing else? It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter who you are. He loves us all. I would like to say to them, if I was ever given the chance, can you tell me then that God love Hitler? Can you tell me? If he's a God of love, is Hitler in heaven, is he? I could name terrorists in this country, individuals that are well-known in Republican and loyalist circles who have butchered and bombed and destroyed lives. There are people here who still bear the scars of the terrorist campaign in this country. Are you saying to me that those individuals so loved of God despite their wickedness and sin are in heaven? Because that's what the ecumenical churches are saying. And they believe in the universal love of God. And they believe that there's no hell. And everybody goes to heaven. So why? Why? 
Do you live a moral life? Why do you obey the Bible? Why do you come to Christ or believe? What was the purpose of the cross? They have to explain that one, and they do. They tell us that we don't believe. I remember doing a mission, a mission in a memorial hall. And I remember some of the local churches, one in particular, they told their people, do not attend. That's from the pulpit. They told their people, do not attend that mission. Now, you can you imagine that? Do not attend that mission from officially the pulpit when we were going to evangelize in that area. Now, I'm glad the Lord came into that mission. Six precious souls were saved that we know of in that gospel campaign. And can I tell you, right to this very hour, every single one of them are going on with God. And that's over 15, 16 years ago. I'm saying to you uh, that they call our preaching slaughterhouse religion. They don't like the blood. They don't like the substitutionary nature of Christ's work. They would never sing a hymn that we have just sung. He died an atoning death for thee. He died an atoning death. They don't believe and they've taken out of their hymn books every reference to the blood of Christ. Even in their versions of scripture, they remove every reference to the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, they tell us that the cross was a mistake. It wasn't. It was an act of love, but it was an act of justice. It was an act of compassion, but an act of righteousness. It was an act of benevolence. I don't deny that. Of course it was. But it was also an act of infinite justice where God punished sin. I want to tell you, God punishes sin. God punishes sin. He doesn't sweep it under the carpet. He doesn't just cast it behind his back. And can I say this without being theologically incorrect? God just doesn't forgive sin. Wow. Wow, people would raise their necks at that one. Of course he does. He forgives sins. Can I tell you something? He punishes sin. He forgives the offense. He forgives the guilt. He cleanses the stain. I want to tell you God punishes sin. He just doesn't like human beings. When you say you're sorry, he says, okay, I'll forgive you. He doesn't operate like that. God punishes sin. He's just and he's righteous. That's the teaching of Scripture. And God punishes sin in two ways. One, on the sinner, personally, in hell, God punishes sin. Or two, vicariously, by means of a substitute. That is, Christ takes our place. All the sin of all Christ-believing people is laid on him. For the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And when it was found to have met upon the sinless, spotless, impeccable body of God's dear son. God punished sin. Sorry about that. Forgot about that microphone. God punishes sin. So remember that sinner. God punishes sin. And he does it two ways. On you and your body and soul in hell for all eternity. You remember God punishes sin. Or upon the body of Christ when you come as a guilty lost soul, repenting of your sin and receive Christ as your saviour, you'll find that all your sins have been perfectly met and judged and punished in its penalty death on the body of God's dear son. And God raised him from the dead because the sacrifice was accepted. And now God, payment twice will not demand for those who are saved. First at my surety's hand, Christ, and then again at mine. But remember this, God punishes sin. You'll not find those te that teaching in ecumenical churches today. You'll not find those that are paid high salaries to be leading churchmen, to guide the people and to lead the people. They will not tell them that God is a God of judgment. In fact, we've been the victim over many years of individuals who have criticized the ministry, who have accused us wrongly and falsely. We've had vicious phone calls to the manse over many, many years from individuals in the community uh, telling us about how we're a bunch of haters and uh, telling us that we have no compassion and no love. I was able to tell one person on the phone who gave me a little audience. I was able to tell that individual. I says, well, you know, when it's a strange thing, uh, do you love people? Of course I do. Of course I do. Is that right? Well, do you love me? She couldn't answer it. <laughs> oh, she loves everybody. But her love stops at the gates of evangelical and reformed, and there I said, free Presbyterian churches. And I says, well, could you tell me what your name is? I'm not going to tell you my name. And here's what she said. Because your people 
would come and burn my house down. Wow. And he says, Mrs. would only break your windows and wouldn't burn it down. No, I didn't. I didn't. I promise you, I didn't. I didn't. And I says to her, oh, is that right? But you hung up. Oh, she hung up. Just before she hung up, I did say to her, oh, by the way, can I tell you, do you know Dr. Nigel Campbell from the health center? He's in our church. So he's going to burn your house down. Do you know, and John McMillan knows these people I'm talking about, do you know Charlie Waddell? He's the duty sergeant in the police station in Lisburn. So he's going to burn your house down. I went through the list of teachers. I went through the list of headmistresses. I went through the list of builders. I went through the list of businessmen. And thankfully we had them in the church and I wasn't making it up. Although I might have if I felt I could get a point on her. She slammed the phone down. About 20 minutes later she phoned again. The number's blocked. And she says, I, I, I'd just like to say sorry for saying you'd burn, her, burn my house down. Uh, before I could say anything more, she just threw the phone down again. Such is their hatred for the preaching of the gospel. And friends, I want to tell you something. The Bible says there's the offense of the cross. We can't avoid it. You can be as nice as you like. You can be as sweet as you want to be. And as sincere and kind and have a compassionate, tender heart. As much as you want to be. The sweetest compassion that you could ever manage to put out in the public domain. When you touch on the cross and you're faithful to the word of God. You will offend people. You will offend the pride of man. You will offend people because you have to bring them to a place. And there's no doubting that legislation is going to come in and tell us that we are offending people by calling them sinners. The first thing I will have to say is this. Have you ever been to my church then to hear that? No, but I know you said. Oh, well, you need to be there. You need to come. Come some, some Sunday night and come and hear it for yourself. Because the Bible says we're sinners. But there's going to be legislation because we're living in a world now that has no confidence. And self-esteem is gone. And if you add to that pain and trauma and misery. You see whenever I was young. I had to live with disappointment. I was going to say when I failed my exams. But I never sat any exams to fail. I was going to say I had to live with it. And whenever my father went out and got drunk. And he never brought money in to feed us. I had to live with that disappointment. I had to get on with life. But today. They're counseled. They're traumatized. They can never work again. All of those things. And yet, no matter what you do in the gospel, you will offend. Because judgment is a serious and it's a somber thing. And this theme runs throughout the minor prophets. And we can't avoid it. It's in our Bible. Large sections of scripture given over to judgment because it's going to happen. I'll tell you this. You will find how little there really is in the Bible about judgment when judgment actually comes. You would say, oh, that God would be more intense and more books would have been written and I might have listened. I want to tell you something. Even though there are huge sections of scripture given over, yes, to righteousness, yes, to truth, yes, to love, yes, to compassion and all of those things and all the, the qualities and the attributes of our God and our blessed Savior and the Holy Spirit. We know all those things to be true. But I want to tell you, God emphasizes his righteousness and his holy law and any transgression of that law will be punished and a definition of sin you could not get a better one than found in 1 John 3 4 sin is transgression of the law and you know what that is transgression of the law it's like and I don't want to make little of this it's as though I would just take a little line here today and just draw a white line across there and say to individuals now don't step over that line now that's the law. There it is. There's the boundary. There's the limit. And I, I said to you, now don't step over that line. And if you do, you're in trouble. Now I'm not going to do it tonight. But suddenly someone comes up and they're chest out and they just look at the line and they just step over and defy you. Well, that's exactly what God has done. He's drawn the line for sinners. He says, don't cross that boundary. Don't cross that line. One law was given to Adam. In the day that thou eatest thereof, you're not to eat. In the day you do, you cross that line. And Adam lifted, along with his wife, deceived by the devil, and sinned against God. And they, they knew what they were doing. They were not in ignorance. 
Can I tell you something? The leap in the fall was massive. You've got to think of it like this. There was no equilibrium. Now, what is that? A perfect balance. A perfect balance. That's what we have there. Equilibrium. There wasn't in the garden. God did not create mankind in equilibrium. Here's how he created mankind. There's sin. There's righteousness. God created all mankind in Adam. Look. With a bent toward righteousness. It had to be a massive jump. To swing that balance to sin. A massive leap. Because he was created righteous. And God gave him one command. And he was in a garden of paradise. And a garden of plenty. And he was in a garden of probation. And if Adam had have reached a certain point. I don't know how long it would be. 40 seems in the Bible to be the period of probation. Would it be 40 days? 40 weeks or 40 years? I don't know. But he would have entered into a state, the eternal state, and he never would have sinned against God. And he was on probation, and he was the federal head of mankind. And God said in his law, his holy law, thou shalt not. And Adam just took a massive leap, I mean a massive leap, to swing the balance towards sin. And now all human beings in Adam's sinful line, they're born. Now look at it, not in equilibrium. They're born with a bent towards sin. And their entire nature is depraved and sinful. And God says, I will punish sin. Now there's a need for a remedy. There needs to be a way of escape. And sinners have nothing to offer God. Nothing to give to God. And nothing God would accept from them. And they're helpless and hopeless. And that's the truth. But God in love. That's where love comes in. God in love sent his son to die for our sins and even in the minor prophets. The judgment is always tempered with mercy. Sadly such preaching is absent today in many congregations. Tonight I want to consider with you the terrible and the tragic end of the Edomites. I will do so following the pattern of the book. First of all you have the reasons for this judgment from God. You see God never judges a nation or an individual. But he first states the reason why that judgment so that every mouth may be stopped and that all men, as Paul says, might become guilty before God. And as far as Edom was concerned, or Esau, several sins are mentioned. Why God will judge and destroy this entire nation, the descendants of Esau. Notice there is pride. Look what verse 3 and 4 says in the book of Obadiah. There's pride. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. They believed that such was the fortification of that ancient city of Petra, which would have been the capital of Esau or Edom. In the rocks, they built the city out of the rocks. I tell you, it's one of, one of those wonders of the, the old world, was the city of Petra. You can visit it today, and you'll see it. And you'll see some of the magnificence of that city. But I'll tell you this. You'll not hear a human voice except your own. You will stand in that valley. And you will look to the clefts of those rocks. And it would be good for us if we could have done it before this message. Is to take our Bibles and go to Petra now. And just open our Bibles and read the book of Obadiah. And then look at that city. This book would come up, become alive. You would understand where I'm coming from tonight. And you would read this prophecy. And you, you would hear... Not a single human voice but your own. But you will hear an owl. You will hear a jackal. And it will howl from one end of that valley. And it's eerie. And it's frightening. And another jackal would answer that other beast. And there in that ancient city of Petra. Where God said in the book of Obadiah. I'll destroy you. And it was destroyed during the Maccabean age. Whenever. Whenever the Maccabeans took on the, the Edomites or the Idumeans, as they were called then because they were already partially destroyed when they joined forces with Babylon to destroy their brother Jacob and to wipe them out as they're being taken into captivity. And as a result of that, God says, you're full of pride. You say that your city is inaccessible. Is that what you're saying? The pride of your heart has lifted you up and they literally had a little cavern. That's all you had. A little narrow pathway that got into that city to climb. And they only needed a few men and they could have held off an army. Such was the narrow chasm 
that you had to get through to get into the city of Petra. All they needed was a, a dozen or so men or 20 men at the most. And those men could have fought off an entire army. And they felt they could never be touched. And they were, in one sense, the pride of the nations. Look at us. The most prosperous city, beautiful in its day in the ancient world, was Petra and the city of Edom and the Edomites. But the, God says you're lifted up with pride and you're saying no one can touch me. No one could reach me. It didn't take too, too long before the Lord soon answered that pride. Whenever they joined forces with Babylon, they took most of the men out of the city thinking that nobody would touch them. The Nabatines, another tribal group, once they realized that Edom was without its military, they entered in to the inaccessible clefts of the rock and they destroyed the city of Edom. And the Edomites couldn't return to that city. And they settled just south of Judah. And they were called the Edomians. And that's the Edomites up until the time of the Maccabean uprising against the Greeks and the destruction of Edomia and the Edomians, which literally were the, the last of the descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother. Thy pride, pride against me, has really been your downfall. And can I say in the gospel that pride has damned its Millions and ten millions. They're individuals and they're too proud to admit they're sinners. Too proud to take the sinner's place. Too proud to bow the knee before God and accept any mercy from God. Too proud to realize they have nothing to offer God. Too proud to come to Christ in a humble way and repent of their sin and believe on him to the saving of their soul. They would rather work their way to heaven. They would rather present like Cain of old the work of their hand to be accepted with God. They would rather say, look at me. I'm a good person, full of pride, self-righteousness. I go to church. I do the best I can. I try to be a good citizen, you know. I keep the laws of the Bible as best I can. I tithe my tenth in the pound. I do the best I can for charities I'm a good husband I'm a good wife I'm a good father and mother and grandparent and as far as I'm concerned I'm as good as anybody else and maybe that's the way you feel tonight too proud to bow the knee and acknowledge that you're a sinner lost and undone and that you need to be saved and that you're not a Christian but you must become one and you're not born one. You must be born again and become a Christian. There has to be a definitive moment, a specific time when you come as a sinner to Christ, when you believe on him, when you repent and you receive him into your heart and into your life as your own and personal saviour and he saves you from your sin and he washes you in his blood and he takes you as his own and he fills you with his spirit and you live the Christian life and you persevere in the faith, there's not only pride, but notice there's folly. Notice there in verses 8 and 9, and we're not reading all these verses for the sake of time, but verses 8 and 9, there's folly. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even to destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the Mount of Esau, and thy mighty men, O Teman? Teman was the place where the wisest of the Edomites resorted and if you wanted wisdom counsel if you wanted some marital help if you wanted help with your problems or the rebellion of your children if you wanted help financially if you wanted counsel on any matter no matter what it was you went to the wise men of Edom and you went to Teman and it was there that the wise men of Edom gave their counsel and they counseled the city when there was a war when there was different things going on around them, they counseled them, they give them wisdom. And you could always be sure, and in the ancient world, they always said, if you wanted wisdom, then go to the wise men of Timan. And go there, the Edomites will give you wisdom. And God says, let's look at your wisdom. Because of your pride against me, and your wisdom as if we only have to talk to our wise men, and they'll get us out of all of our problems. They will assure us that all will be well, and we'll listen to them, and we'll take counsel from no one but our wise men. Can I say to you, that's the very sin 
that brings the judgment of God upon sinners because some sinners think that they're wiser than this book. They think that they're wiser than God. They think that they are wise and they counsel themselves and they say all of a sudden, I don't believe the Bible's the word of God. That gets them off the hook for obeying this word, doesn't it? That's handy. What wisdom is that? That's folly. I don't believe there's a hell. That's what they say. I don't believe there's a judgment day. And I would never go to your church to hear you preach the way you preach because I don't believe a word of it. I don't believe you need to be saved. I don't believe in a slaughterhouse religion. I don't believe in blood and guts and all that you people preach. And we don't preach that all the time. And we don't go into the gore of Calvary. We don't. We don't. We do touch upon the physical sufferings of our Savior because he suffered physically. The pain and the anguish. We don't go like some films have into the passion of the Christ. We touch upon his physical sufferings in the light of his great atoning work. The greater sufferings were spiritual. The hands of his Father. When God the Father touched the Son for our sin. When Christ bore the accursed load and paid the price in full. We're not ashamed of the cross. We buy our hearts we thank God for the cross. But I will tell you this. There are sinners today and they counsel their own soul. And the book of Job chapter 18 tells us you should read it. Their own counsel shall cast them down. Their own counsel. Maybe you've been counseling your soul. Maybe you've been saying, well, okay, preacher, I know I need to be saved. That's wisdom. But some other time. That's folly. That's what the Edomites were doing. Exercising wisdom, counseling themselves. God will never judge us. We'll never be destroyed. There's not a nation in the world to touch us. What about the Nabateans? What about them? We could take them on any time. Well, I'm sure you could. But when you're not there and they come, what can your women and children do? What folly there was. And not only was there pride, and there was folly, but can I say also to you, there was not only these sins, but... There was hostility. In verses 10 through 15, we did read them. Thou wast as one of them when you stood on the other side. You know, one of the great texts of the early days of the free church was this text of Scripture in the book of Obadiah. Did you know that? And especially there in verses 11 and 12, especially that verse 11, in the day that thou stoodest on the other side. Can I tell you something? That there are ecumenical churches and they st stand on the side of the Roman Catholic Church tonight. The Roman Catholic Church is not a Christian church. It's not. It does not preach the gospel. It damns the souls of its adherents. It has Mary as a mediatrix. It has the mass as an injustice and blasphemy to Christ and a bloodless offering of Christ's body upon the cross again. Calvary wasn't finished for the Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic has no hope at death because they go into purgatory providing they die at peace with their church and if they have enough works, enough prayers, and enough money given to the church, it might ease something of their pain over hundreds, thousands, if it's not millions of years in purgatory. Roman Catholics still go to the graveside of their loved ones today. It's a pity. And they pray over those graves. In fact, there's a Sunday given every so often where Roman Catholics, you'll see them gathered in the graveyard, and it's not a funeral. There's no hearse. They're gathered it's what is known as Cemetery Day or Graveyard Sunday. And they gather, paying their money, lighting their candles, and praying their loved ones out of purgatory. And a bachelor priest tells a loved one, listen to it, how cruel and how wicked is this doctrine. It's foreign to the Bible. And he tells the adherents of the church, I believe your loved one has their hand out. That hand's no longer suffering. Now that's good. So let's have a look at how the hand got out of purgatory. First of all, I asked the priest, how do you know that that hand's out of purgatory? How do you know that? Or that arm, or that leg, or that head, how do you know that? How do you know which part of the body's not suffering? How? And what does it cost the poor benighted Roman Catholic to have that cold comfort Remortgage in their house, getting a loan to give it to the church. 
to get a loved one. Listen, friends, listen to me. Listen to me. And I mean this. I don't mean it in a bad sense. If I believe that, and I believe a million pounds could get my child out of pork purgatory and that awful place of sorrow and suffering, I'm telling you, I would rob a bank. I would go to jail and pay the money just to get him out. What a cruel doctrine. Yet the Bible says there's heaven and hell. And if you're in hell, there's a great gulf fixed. Neither your hand, not even your finger. And I've shown this before. There's the illustration. That's why hell is not on this earth. Look. You can't take a drink of water in hell. And if I was to dip the tip of my little finger in water, look, there's just a wee dab of water. That's all I could actually ask from God. Just touch it on my tongue. It's denied. I want to tell you hell is not upon this earth. Hell's a real place. And there are people today, and in their folly, they've counseled themselves and they said there's no hell. One atheist is on record of saying, I quote, If I believed in a biblical hell as you Christians do, I would never cease telling people about that place. He denied the, the, the doctrine of hell and eternal judgment. But as an atheist, he concluded rightly, if there was such a place as he says there isn't, and there is, then I would never stop. And I would tell everybody I meet, lest they go to that awful place. And we'll talk about everything but hell. There's hostility here. Uh, because these individuals were aided and abetted, the Babylonians, by the Edomites. And they stood on the other side. And they took their place with the enemy. And they didn't stand outside that camp and disassociated themselves. And tonight, friend, I want to tell you, you're no different than the Edomites. What do you mean by that? Don't be offended. I'm telling you, you're not on the side of God at all. You've never been to the cross. You've never repented. You've never obeyed the commands of the gospel. You've never believed tonight if you're not saved. You have never trusted Christ and you're against God and you're in your sin and if you die like that, then you'll be separated from God forever and you'll, you're, you're with the ungodly. That's right. You're with the ungodly. You're standing on the other side. You're either for Christ or against Christ. You're on the side of Christ or you are opposed to Christ. You will either receive Christ or reject Christ. You will either turn to Christ or else you will turn away from Christ. You will either choose Christ or refuse Christ. You'll not be neutral tonight. Oh no, you'll not. You'll go out those doors making a decision tonight. You will either take Christ as your Savior or turn away from Him. You will either trust Him or you will trample under feet the blood of the everlasting covenant. It's a bit like me saying to you, if you want to go to hell tonight, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do, man. Here's what you need to do, woman, young person. I want to do this tonight. I might as well, if you're going out the front door or the side doors, I need to take the cross of Christ. I need to place it in front of you. That's what I need to do. I need to place it in front of you. And that finished work, that sacrifice, that cross, you've got to take it. You've got to lift it and throw it to the side. And you've got to get through the door to get out of this house. And then I have to take the blood of Christ and put it on the doorstep. And you have to trample it under your feet. The precious blood under your feet and not applied to your heart. If you want to go to hell, that's what you need to do. Friend, these are solemn truths. You have the reasons for this judgment. Secondly, you have the results of this judgment. Notice in verse 15, that little phrase that sums up the book of Obadiah. Well, look at verse 15. It says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. Obviously, it's not just Edom, but it's the nations of the earth when Christ comes back again. That's what that reference is, all the heathen. So not just local, not just upon one nation, all. And then the reference now to Edom. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. It's what is known whenever you're coming to study your Bible. In hermeneutics, we have laws of interpretation. And this is what is known as a judgment in kind. You'll find it throughout the Bible. It's a very interesting study. And if you read the Bible systematically, then you should write down what we call judgments in kind. So you can establish the doctrine in your heart and you'll understand it in your life. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. It's what is known. God takes it as a judgment in kind. 
of the same type of sin, the judgment is suited. As thou hast done, I'll do it to you. And that's what God says. And sinner, you reject the Lord. The Lord rejects you. You refuse the Lord. The Lord refuses you. You see how it's what is known as a judgment in kind? It began in the life of Esau in Genesis chapter 25. Whenever he came back from a hunting party and he was starving and the flesh craved food and Jacob had it. And he said to Jacob, give me a morsel. Just give me a, a mess of that pottage. I'm starving. I'm about to die. I'm shaking. Look at me. I'm going to die of hunger. I need it. Give me it. His flesh. His flesh craved it. And Jacob, before he gave it, he was very, very subtle. And he says to him, well, sell me your birthright. You see, Esau had the birthright, the firstborn. Esau was the firstborn. He should have had the descendancy. And the, the nation of Israel should have come from Esau. And Esau looked at his birthright. And he said these words, what good is my birthright to me now if I die? Give me the food and you can have it. And so the birthright passed to Jacob. And that's when God says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, because Esau hated me. It's a judgment in kind, do you see it? He despised me, I despise him. He rebelled against me, I will turn against him. And that's what it is, a judgment in kind. And sinner, that's exactly how God works in his justice, a judgment in kind. He doesn't punish people for the fun of it, or because he delights in it. Some devilish, ghoulish delight in punishing people? No, no, no. God is just. And as you have done, he will do to you. And whenever you turn from the Lord and forsake the Lord, what does God do? He forsakes the sinner in hell. A judgment in kind. Forever and forever. There's one final thought and it's this. You have the reassurance in this judgment. And that's the last verse of the book of Obadiah. In verse 21 we read these words. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Do you see that? The kingdoms have come. Esau, Edom. Uh, even Babylon, Assyria. The Greek and Roman empires. The Medo-Persian empires. Alexander the Great. We can go through history. We can talk about the... Uh, the old Roman Empire, we can also bring it even up to date. We can think of the great nations of this world. We can think of America. We can think of so-called Great Britain. It's no longer great. And Britannia ruled the waves. We can think of all the Russians, the Americans. We can think of the, uh, the Muslims and the Islamic religions in Iran and Iraq when they have the brotherhood and they can join together in a confederacy to take on Israel, whatever it means put aside their problems and difficulties and join together as huge nations which will happen prior to the second coming of Christ when the nations will turn against Israel. I believe even America and Britain will turn against Israel. Friends now, but they will turn. And then the Lord will return as those nations gather in the Middle East, the prophetic earth. You can keep your eye on the Middle East. No matter what's going on in this country, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't figure in Bible prophecy. But what does figure is Israel, Jerusalem, and the Jew today, the second coming of Christ. And here's what the Bible says, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The nations will be judged, but the kingdoms, the kingdom will be the Lord's. Christ's kingdom is everlasting. I wonder, are you a citizen of Christ's kingdom? Are you a subject of heaven's king? Where do you stand in your allegiance with Christ? Are you saved tonight? Is it well with your soul? Have you been to the cross tonight? Are you born again? Are you a child of the king? Are you a subject and a citizen of heaven? Are you in the kingdom of God and his Christ? Tell me, where do you stand with the Lord tonight? His throne is established in heaven. His kingdom will rule over all. And forever and forever and forever, his kingdom will have no end. But the kingdoms of this world... The nations of this world and the inhabitants out of Christ will be destroyed with everlasting destruction at the presence of the Lord in that place the Bible calls hell. Now tell me, tell me are you saved? Is it well with your soul? If you're not saved tonight, will you, will you do something? Will you wait behind tonight? Will you just bow your heart now and acknowledge you're a sinner? Will you come to Christ? Will you be saved? I want to tell you something. I, I always keenly feel this at holiday season. People go off and we may never see them again. 
Soon I'll be going off on holiday at the end of this month. And maybe for three or four weeks, I may never see you. I may never preach to you again. And I was so keen and keenly touched on this when I was minister in Lisburn. For 23 years, I said the same thing every year. Folks, I'm going on, ho on holiday. This is my last Sunday night preaching in this house for a number of weeks. I may not see you again. I may never see you. I may never preach the word to you. It might happen tonight. I'm saying to you now, will you come to Christ? Will you? Will you be saved tonight? If you say, preacher, I need help. Well, listen, we're here. Should it take to midnight? We're here. We'll open the Bible. Gladly show you from the word of God how you can be saved. Sure of heaven. I know that you're in the kingdom of God and his kingdom will last forever. Father in heaven, do bless thy word. And as we have finished now in the minor prophets, we recognize, Lord, the help that thou hast been to us and given to us. And we just acknowledge it. And just in closing, we just thank thee, O God, for the instruction of the word, for the glorious gospel that's found throughout even the Old Testament. And we thank thee even in the book of Obadiah, an obscure book by many ways and an unread book, a book that's not familiar to many believers, yet we find Christ, the love of God, the gospel of thy grace, thy righteousness and judgment, tempered with mercy. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless the word tonight and you'll save the lost. Part us in thy fear now and with thy favor, for we offer this our prayer with thanksgiving in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.